You will hear a male student talking to a union representative about placing an advertisement to sell a laptop. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now the test will begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hi, I'm Debbie. How can I help? Hi, my name's David. I'm just looking to place an advertisement on the main union notice board to sell a laptop and a few accessories if that's possible. Sure, that's not a problem. I take it you are a member of the Students' Union? Yes, I am. Right then. I'll just get a form up. And as there is no one around, and it looks as if it's going to be quiet for a while, I'll just type the details straight into the computer for you. Thanks very much. No problem. Shall we just title it Laptop for Sale? Yeah, OK. Can you describe it generally? Well, it's in very good condition. In fact, it's hardly been used. Why are you selling it, if I may ask? Well, I've got another one which is much lighter and I don't really need two. I see. What weight is the one you're selling? It's uh, 3.5 kilograms. That is heavy these days. Can you give more details about the one you want to sell? Right. Uh, well, it's an Allegro and it's got all the latest programs. OK. What about the memory? The memory is only 0.5 gigabytes. And what about the screen size and the other features? Oh, well, uh, the, uh, the screen is, well, let's see, it's 37.5 uh, centimetres with a standard size keyboard and a touchpad. But I've got a cordless mouse that I can put in with it if necessary. Well, some people don't like using a touchpad. What about ports or holes for attaching things to the laptop? It's got two ports. Mm. More modern laptops have more than two ports for all the extra attachments. They do. Uh, let's see, uh, what else is important? Uh, oh yeah, the, uh, the battery lasts for two and a half hours, which is okay, but not enough for long train journeys. Uh, but one thing is that it's not wireless. Right, okay, not wireless. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Anything else I can put on the advertisement? There's a webcam built at the top of the screen and uh, I can throw in a printer, a scanner and headphones, which I, I got with it in a special deal. It also comes with its own case for carrying it around. Uh, actually, the case is quite smart. I'm hoping these things will help it sell. They should do. Right, I think I've got all that. How much do you want for it? That, I'm not sure about. Uh, it's worth about £900 to £1,000 new. Yeah, but you won't get that much if it's used, and even if it's in good condition. What about £500? I doubt if you'd get as much as that. More like £200 or £300. If you look at the notice board, there is one on there which is comparable to yours, and it's not more than about... £250, I think. As little as that? I'm afraid so. Shall we say £300? OK, put that. Can I take some contact details for the advert? The name's David Bristow. B-R-I-S-T-O-W. Yes, that's it. And uh, a mobile or email? Both, if you want. 
It's D I B underscore seven seven nine one at hotmail dot com. Okay, and the mobile? That's o nine eight seven five four two three three eight seven. That's it. If you send the picture, I'll add it and print it out and stick it up for you. Okay, I can get that to you today. Right. I'll type in here, advert placed the twenty second of October. Fine, and good luck with the sale. Thanks. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a discussion between three people in a university tutorial. In the first part of the discussion, they're talking about city traffic and the motor car. First, look at questions eleven to fourteen. Listen carefully. We're very pleased to welcome Professor Isaac Nebworth to our tutorial group today, and he's come to share one of his pet passions with us: city traffic and our Western dependence on the motor car. I believe questions are quite welcome throughout. Thank you. Well, I know you're all very familiar with the superhighway here in Melbourne, but do superhighways automatically lead to super wealth? As our politicians would have us believe, I think not. Can you give us an example of what you mean exactly? Sure. Well, by continuing to encourage this dependence on the motor car, we simply create more congestion and more urban sprawl. And you can see that here in Melbourne, right under your nose. Excuse me. I would just like to say that I feel the sprawl is part of the city. The freeways mean people can enjoy the benefits of living away from the centre on larger blocks with gardens, but still be able to drive back into the city centre for work or entertainment. Well, I'm not convinced that people want to do that. And is our money being well spent? It may be okay for you now, but come back to me in five years' time. Let's take City Link, for example, the new freeway here in Melbourne. Well. I use the freeway all the time. I think it's great. Ah, yes, but it cost two billion dollars to build, and you could have gotten ten times the value by putting the money into public transport. If you give the automobile road space, it will fill that space, and you'll soon find you'll be crawling along your city link. But surely you cannot simply blame the car. Some of the blame must rest with governments and city planners. Well, there is an argument, surely, that building good roads is actually beneficial because most new cars these days are highly efficient. They use far less petrol than in the past, and emissions of dangerous gases are low. Old congested roads, on the other hand, encourage traffic to move slowly, and it's the stationary cars that cause the pollution and smog. Whereas good roads increase traffic speeds, and thus the amount of time cars are actually on the roads. Well, this is the old argument put forward by the road lobby, but for me it's clear cut: roads equal cars, which equal smog. Public transport is the way to go. In the second part of the discussion, the professor talks about public transport in different cities. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions fifteen to twenty.
You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Now, on that topic of public transport, I read somewhere recently that Australia isn't doing too badly in the challenge to increase the use of public transport. Better than America, granted, but by comparison with Canada, it's not so good. For instance, if you compare Toronto with the U.S. metropolis of Detroit, only 160 kilometers away, in Detroit. Only one percent of passenger travel is by public transport, whereas in Toronto it's twenty-four percent, which is considerably better than Sydney, which can only boast sixteen percent. Well, I think it's encouraging that our least car-dependent city is actually our largest city. Sixteen percent of trips being taken on public transport in Sydney isn't too bad. But it's a long way behind Europe. Take both London and Paris, for instance, where 30 percent of all trips taken are on public transport. Well, they do both have an excellent underground system. And Frankfurt comes in higher still at 32 percent. I understand that they've been very successful in Copenhagen at ridding the city of the car. Can you tell us anything about that experiment? Yes, indeed. Copenhagen is a wonderful example of a city that has learned to live without the motor car. Back in the 1960s, they adopted a number of policies designed to draw people back into the city. For instance, they paid musicians and artists to perform in the streets. They also built cycle lanes, and now 30 percent of the inhabitants of Copenhagen use a bicycle to go to work. Sydney, by comparison, can only boast one percent of the population cycling to work. It could have something to do with all the hills. Then they banned cars from many parts of the city, and every year three percent of the city parking is removed. And by constantly reducing parking, they've created public spaces and clean air. Really? There are also freely available bicycles, which you can hire for practically nothing. And of course, they have an excellent public transport system. Well, that's all very well for Copenhagen, but I just like to say that some cities are just too large for a decent public transport system to work well, particularly in areas with low population. Because if there aren't many people using the service, then they don't schedule enough buses or trains for that route. I accept that there is a vicious circle here, but people do need to support the system. And secondly, the whole process takes so long because usually you have to change. You know, from bus to train, that sort of thing, and that can be quite difficult. Ultimately, it's much easier to jump in your car, and often it turns out to be cheaper. Sure, but cheaper for whom? You or society? We have to work towards the ideal and not give in all the time because things are too difficult. Anyway, let's move on to some of the results of the survey, which I think you'll agree. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two students, Dylan and Emily, discussing a presentation which they will have to make. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Okay, Emily. As you know, we've got to do this presentation together. I know. I'm a little bit nervous about it, standing up in front of all those people. And what if the presentation fails? What if? Don't worry. I've been reading a book about giving effective presentations. It's not that hard, but the way to do it is certainly not always obvious either. For example, do you know what the most important part of a presentation is? The final summary, I guess. 
the opposite. The first minute, in fact, the theory says that that first minute is when you win or lose the audience. If you lose them at that point, you'll probably never get them back. So that's why you need a hook. A hook? You mean like when you catch fish? Yes. I mean not exactly, but yes, we want to catch the audience, right? So we need to start in a way which wakes them up, gets them interested, and makes them watch us. I see. Basically, no matter how good our presentation is, if the message doesn't get across, the presentation fails. So we need to give a fact which really amazes them, or an interesting story, or pose a dilemma which makes them think something they can really puzzle over. It's better if this is related to the subject, of course, something to do with management. In our case, so that's the hook. That's right. From then on, we'll just follow the basic advice. Like what? Like talk to your audience, you know, as equals. Don't talk down to them or up to them. They're just the same as us, right? You're right. You know, some of the best presentations I've ever seen sounded just like conversations. Exactly. And what else made them good? Well, the speakers sort of involved me in the topic and issues under discussion by asking questions, by、uh, referring to me. You know, by saying you and well, basically they were interesting. And they're exactly the tips we'll follow too. It should be fine. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. Emily, I think this will be a fine presentation, but how are we going to divide it up? For example, who's going to open it? You or me? Well, I think you have a very natural style, so you should start. This talk has five main parts, so you can introduce it and then do part one. That's the historical context or background to the issue. Yes. Then I'll do part two about current views. You do part three, and I'll do part four, leaving both of us to handle the question time. I'm okay with that. In part one, I'll probably speak at length about Hoffman's theory about management styles and compare differences in culture in relation to the style of management used. That sounds good. Those differences are important and certainly relevant to the current times. Hoffman makes some excellent points too on this issue. That's why I'll follow up with present-day perspectives and viewpoints on this, such as the problems facing today's managers in the complex multicultural workplace, where basically one can no longer assume one is dealing with a single culture in the workplace, but actually a multiculture. That sounds good, also. Then I'll take over discussing the implications and problems of this. I suppose you'll look at the pluralist movement. Yeah, I was thinking about that, but then I changed my mind. I've decided I'll look at the productive diversity argument. It's more interesting anyway, so I'll go with that. Then I'll tell everyone what we've decided is the best business practice, or what is most likely to work in most situations, which is basically ignoring pluralism and productive diversity, and linking everything back to Cotter's theory of human universals. Yes, the theory that argues modern management should target the universals of human nature. Right, and that leaves both of us to field questions at the end. Are there any questions we can predict so that we have some good answers ready about resolving industrial disputes, for example? Well, I'd say that industrial democracy usually surprises people, so we should expect a lot of questions about that. Yes, the theory is that it increases productivity and reduces industrial delays, and results in better decision making. But that's all theory. Most people would think that industrial democracy is just about unworkable in practice. So let's be ready to explore that issue in some depth, as well as any other related topics. Okay, 
OK. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear an interview with a marketing director. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 34. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 34. Continuing our theme of business marketing, I have with me today Mr. Brian Kinsella, who is here to talk about the differences between marketing a product and marketing a service. Good morning. Now I understand that many of you here today are interested in a career in services marketing. Well, I've been the marketing director for Oceania Travel for nearly 11 years so I feel that I can present what I consider to be the most important aspects of marketing a service. However, before I begin, I want to clarify what I mean by services marketing. This not only means aspects like holiday destinations, but also professional services such as legal advice. In short, anyone that sells a service. Actually, a lot of the traditional services such as lawyers, accountants, etc., have not felt too comfortable marketing their services. It's almost perceived in industries such as these that the need to market indicates a weakness in the services provided. However, more and more such industries are realizing the importance of marketing to sustain their customer numbers, especially when their competitors are marketing themselves. Now, the main difference between marketing a product and a service is that the customers cannot understand exactly what the service will be. They can see a product and can comprehend exactly what the product will do for them. A service is more intangible. By that, I mean whatever each customer gains from the service is often very personal. For example, with a travel agency, clients choose to travel abroad for a multitude of motives. Some people travel overseas for the experience, and really want to get to know the culture of the local people. Others wish to escape from reality, totally relax in sophisticated comfort, and be waited on hand and foot. Obviously, our clients will not be judging what we offer by the same standards, and travel agents, like other such service industries, have an extremely difficult job in satisfying a range of customers from diverse backgrounds with different expectations. Before you hear the rest of the recording, you have some time to look at questions 35 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 35 to 40. Our company has overcome this dilemma in a number of ways. First of all, our travel consultants are given extensive training in customer service and buyer behavior. Our aim is not just to be a profit-making organization, but also to meet and exceed the expectations or dreams of our clients. Our mission statement, in fact, is primarily to offer a service which is above and beyond the hopes of our clients. 
In addition, we regularly visit the tourist destinations we promote and inform all of our staff about any changes in specific areas. Not only is it important to be fully informed about every possible aspect of the service you are marketing, it is also essential to constantly improve the service offered. At Oceania Travel, we regularly conduct surveys with all of the people that visit our resorts of choice. Any negative feedback we try to remedy at once. Our clients are met by a company representative during their stay, and we have a set procedure for dealing with any complaints. Our clients are not expected to have to approach the hotel reception, as we have a 24-hour contact service direct to our representatives, and this representative should always welcome any customer problems or questions. In the event of a complaint, the representative will then try to remedy the complaint with the hotel. If the problem cannot be rectified by the hotel manager, our representative is authorised to remedy the situation him or herself. For situations beyond the representative's authority, our complaints department is contacted. The complaints department guarantees a solution within the day. If the customer is still not satisfied, they are welcome to approach our head office on their return. So you see that marketing a service is catering more for the client's expectations than anything else, and it is that which makes services marketing a very intricate business. Now that's the end of my presentation, but if there is anything you want to ask, then please feel free to do so. Thank you. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.